Hi, I am Jesus, aka Striker. The cask of Amontillado is the 39th story of the American writer, poet, critic, and journalist Edgar Allan Poe, publicated in November of 1846 in a issue of Goody's Ladies Book, which was, at the time, the most popular periodical in America. The Cask of Amontillado is a subterranean tale of vengeance and murder. The tale's narrator, the Venetian nobleman Montresor, who through his voice we realize is a man of stature and education from a respectable family that plainly states he has been wronged and insulted by a certain Fortunato unwilling to submit to any more insults and misdeeds, he declares, I vowed revenge. As a result of this startling disclosure, at the story's opening, we, the readers, are much better informed of Montresor's true motivations than Fortunato himself is. What we don't know is what kind of vengeance Montresor has in mind, or how, exactly, he intends to pull it off. The story's morbid pleasure lies in the gradual unfolding of Montresor's carefully laid plans. Montresor approaches Fortunato on the street as dusk is beginning to fall and Carnival is in full swing. Since medieval times, the Italian city of Venice has celebrated Carnival in the days before Lent. Venetians take to the streets in costumes, distinctive masks, and it is said that in this disguise they sometimes forget their inhibitions. Montresor is dressed in a black silk mask. He finds Fortunato in the center of the merrymaking dressed in the multicolored costume of a court jester, complete with cap and bells. But Montresor tempts Fortunato away from the crowd, with an invitation he won't refuse. Montresor has purchased a cask of what he believes to be fine Spanish Amontillado sherry, but he can't be sure it's genuine. Fortunato fancies himself a connoisseur of fine wine and very much enjoys drinking it. In fact, when Montresor meets him, he's already tipsy, having piqued Fortunato's interest in the Amontillado. Montresor now plays at dissuading Fortunato from coming to taste it, but Fortunato is determined to do it. Montresor protests repeatedly. Fortunato is busy socializing. The damp vault where the sherry is stored will aggravate Fortunato's health troubles. But each protestation is met with even more enthusiasm from Fortunato. Of course, this is exactly what Montresor was expecting. He leads Fortunato to his palazzo as the two men descend into the crypt beneath the house, where the wine is stored. It becomes clear just how precisely Montresor has prepared his revenge. He has dismissed all his servants for the night, and is confident none will return from the carnival festivities until the next morning. The two men are completely alone in the house. The conditions are perfect for Montresor to take his revenge undetected. What shape that revenge will take remains unclear. Together, they descend below into a maze of cavernous tunnels that Montresor, in his narration, alternately refers to as the family vaults and the family catacombs. A catacomb is a subterranean cemetery with recesses built into the walls where corpses can be entombed, more than just a place where wine is stored. 
The tunnels beneath the palazzo are where generations of Montresor's family have been buried, and while we, the reader, are still no closer to knowing what revenge Montresor intends to inflict on his companion, a throwaway line offers a possible insight into Montresor's motives. Fortunato remarks on how extensive the vaults are, and Montresor replies, Note the past tense, that the Montresors were a great and numerous family. He also mentions the family motto, Nemo me impune la cesit, meaning, nobody provokes me with impunity. Perhaps, then, Fortunato has attacked Montresor's family honor. The two men keep walking into the vault. As they continue, Fortunato's sensitive lungs become aggravated by the damp surroundings and the deposits of nitre. In other words, potassium nitrate, chemical compound given off by the walls. Due to humidity, the place was full of saltpeter. Take into account these passageways were under the river. What's more, Montresor keeps offering Fortunato flasks of fine wine to drink from, which he accepts enthusiastically. As they move deeper into the vault, the drunken, coughing, wheezing Fortunato, in contrast to his name, begins to seem more and more unfortunate. When the men have nearly reached their destination, Fortunato startles Montresor by making a distinctive hand sign. Montresor can see that Fortunato's gesture is laden with meaning, but he doesn't understand it at all. Fortunato explains that it is used between members of the secret society known as Masons. He asks if Montresor is also a mason, and Montresor responds by showing Fortunato the trowel concealed beneath his robes, as if to say that he is indeed a mason. A stone mason? Now Fortunato is baffled, for while he laughs at what he takes to be his companion's joke, Montresor is quite serious. Just how serious we will soon find out. Montresor leads poor Fortunato, who is still swinging wine and cracking jokes, into a crypt where human bones hang from three of the four walls. On the fourth wall, there is a recess where Montresor says the Amontillado is stored but when Fortunato moves into the recess to grasp the cask, Montresor swiftly chains him to a rock. Fortunato is perplexed, but not, at this stage, alarmed. Using his trowel, Montresor begins to cover the entrance to the recess with stone and mortar. It is not until Montresor has laid the first tier of masonry that Fortunato seems to understand what is happening. He begins to moan and plead with Montresor for his life. Too little, too late. Montresor works until midnight, laying tier upon tier of stone and entombing Fortunato. As he prepares to lay the very last stone, Montresor hears Fortunato cry out, For the love of God, Montresor! Before placing the final stone, he throws a torch into the recess. The only reply is the faint ringing on the bells on Fortunato's costume, and then silence. The cask of Amontillado is pure Edgar Allan Poe. It begins with the bold choice to have the narrator effectively reveal the end of the story in its very first sentence. 
We know immediately that this story will see Montresor take his revenge on Fortunato. What we don't know is what form that revenge will take. In his earlier work, The Murders at the Rue Morgue, Poe is credited with inventing the modern detective story. In a sense, the cask of Amontillado is an anti-detective story. Not a whodunit, but a howdunit. And the story still drips with suspense as we try to piece together Montresor's plan. Watching as the guileless Fortunato moves unavoidably toward his gruesome fate. The story takes up one of Poe's most significant and macabre motives, that of the life burial. Like many of Poe's finest stories, it is a painfully claustrophobic read. Apart from a brief scene in the throngs of the Venice Carnival, all the action takes place underground in the narrow and labyrinthine vaults beneath Montresor's palazzo. But beyond physical claustrophobia, the reader also experiences a form of psychological claustrophobia. The story is narrated in the first person by Montresor. In this way, the reader has access to all of his scheming, unsavory thoughts. For the duration of the story, the reader is trapped in the mind of a man who executes a cold-blooded murder, not just with grim relish, but with an artistic flourish. Interestingly, Montresor's true motivation for seeking revenge is never revealed. In the end, we are left with the impression that this murder could just as well have been committed for pure pleasure as it could have for vengeance. The terror of this tale isn't just in the final act, but in the behavior of the narrator, Montresor. I read the story several times, trying to grasp the level of madness from which he suffers. Is this truly a tale of revenge, as he states in the beginning, or is it a tale of jealousy fueled by insanity? I think the name Montresor was intended to be read as the French Montresor, which means my treasure. He does tow Fortunato away rather safely, and perhaps Fortunato stole something from him that maybe he regarded as a treasure or was Montresor a treasure for Poe as a character or a fictional representation of something in his life that was associated with his family perhaps paradoxically and even ironically Fortunato was the treasure and got hidden as such I love this small intertextual links that Poe has quite a lot, but they are just theories. All the narrator states is that he suffered a thousand injuries and received unspecified insults. Was the narrator jealous of his friend, whose name is Fortunato, Italian for fortunate one? and that is the impetus for the deadly revenge. So, the real mystery or horror of the story is more about why the narrator killed Fortunato rather than the fact that he does it at all. Another curious thing is that both of the characters were dressed as fools in Carnival, a festivity where people are dressed as equals, regardless of their socio-economic class. We learn that the narrator gets away with the murder, because the story ends with Montresor thinking about the dead man 50 years later. So it could be a confession of some sort, maybe to a priest. Montresor's had the following coat of arms, a huge human foot door in a field azure, 
the foot crushes a serpent rampant, whose fangs are embedded in the heel. Poe was a genius, but he was no herald. For one thing, it's difficult to see how a serpent, which lacks arms and legs, can be rampant. A serpent could be lodged in heraldic description language, prone with the head raised. It could be involved a term that will be familiar to mathematicians, hands involuted or in a circle, it could be gliding on the ground, blazonous, fastways, or horizontal. But Poe did not necessarily want to represent a realistic shield, but rather to make an allegory to his characters and his story, and relate them to an opponent who had criticized him in real life. Thomas Dunn English a writer and Democrat politician member of the U.S. House of Representatives. For this reason, the story insinuates that Fortunato is a mason, in the form of mockery. Montresor showing the trowel is great foreshadowing for the final act of Amurement. Montresor could have enacted his revenge anywhere. It is carnival season, the perfect time for strangulation stabbing, a drowning or a bludgeoning, and Fortunato will just be thought of an unfortunate victim of some ruffians. But Montresor wants something more. He wants Fortunato to forever reside among the bones of his ancestors. He doesn't just want him dead. He wants to own him forever. The revenge, if that is what this is will never end. There is a moment when Montresor realizes he isn't feeling well. I quote, My heart grew sick on account of the dampness of the catacombs. At the beginning of this sentence, I'm feeling oddly relieved to discover that he is feeling some remorse. Maybe the madness that has taken him over has finally been overcome by the horror of his own actions. But all of that is dispelled by him, blaming those feelings on the dampness. There is a couple of points, too, where he suggests to Fortunato that they should turn back, but he tempered each of those suggestions with a prod that will ensure that his inebriated friend will want to continue. Is this a demented way to assuage his guilt? Can he convince himself that he tried to save him? It was Fortunato's choice to accept his death. The final moment of conversation between Montresor and Fortunato heightened the horror and suggests that Fortunato ultimately achieve some type of upper hand over Montresor. Fortunato's plea for the love of God, Montresor, has provoked much critical controversy. Some critics suggest that Montresor has at last brought Fortunato to the pit of desperation and despair, indicated by his invocation of a God that has long left him behind. Other critics, however, argue that Fortunato ultimately mocks the love of God, thereby employing the same irony that Montresor has effectively used to lure him into the crypt. These are Fortunato's final words. What if he pronounced them like this? For the love of God, Montresor. In this case, he would be indicating that Montresor is wrong or insane. Thus, Fortunato is really a person, or mere imagination. In my opinion, Montresor carried a treasure or something valuable for him. A fortune, perhaps. Oh, this time. And his sick mind imagined it was a horrible act of true vengeance. All this out of morbidity and psychopathic pleasure upon someone or even something abstract he detested. The strange desperation that Montresor demonstrates in response suggests that he needs Fortunato more than he wants to admit it. Only when he twice screams Fortunato loudly, with no response, Montresor claims. 
to have a sick heart. The reasons for Fortunato's silence are perfect for my own interpretation, because he never existed at all. But perhaps his willing refusal to answer Montresor is a type of strange victory in otherwise dire circumstances. Edgar Allan Poe is most assuredly playing with your mind, as he does in most of his stories. He shares little clues that for the discerning reader are there to be discovered. My suggestion is to read the story a few times, and each time, hopefully, a new layer of the story will reveal itself to you.